would have once attributed the fact that he'd gained awakening to the quality of not staying content with where he was in his practice. Now, this may seem strange because we know that contentment is an important principle in the practice. But you have to understand what things to be content about and what not to be content about. And even in the areas where the Buddha taught contentment, you have to understand exactly what it means. Not being content where he was in the practice meant that as long as there was still any suffering or any cause of suffering in his mind, He wouldn't allow it, the practice just to sit there. You're trying to figure out what was causing that suffering, where it was coming from, what qualities he would have to develop in order to see even deeper into the mind. That was something he was always working on. We see this in the story of his life. He gained really high levels of concentration from his study with his two teachers. But he realized that this didn't lead to total end, a total end of suffering. It just led to a very refined state of mind in the present moment and a very refined rebirth. But when the power of that practice was over, then he'd fall back down to where he'd started from. So he knew he had to look deeper. And so he tried the path of austerities, self-torment. He did it for six years, and as he said, he didn't know anyone who had gone further on that path than he had. And a lesser person might have rested content with that. The pride that comes with that kind of accomplishment. But then he knew that it was, was not really a worthwhile accomplishment in the sense that it didn't really put an end to suffering. So I had to look for another way. That's one of the amazing things about the Buddha was his ability to put his pride aside. He didn't let the sense of his attainments get in the way. There's a case later when he became Buddha. He saw that there was a Brahma, Bhaka Brahma, one of the devas we chanted about just now, who had decided he'd reached the end of the practice. There was nothing higher than where he was. He was extremely proud of his attainment. So the Buddha visited his Brahma world, and had to show him that there was somebody who knew more than he did, knew more than Bhaka Brahma did. Because it's so easy when you gain an attainment, either in terms of concentration or in terms of psychic powers, to allow your pride to get in the way. And the Buddha, by seeing that that was a problem, was able to get past it. So that's an area of the practice where, where you don't rest content. You look at where you are, and if you see there's any potential for suffering or there's any slight amount of stress anywhere in your awareness, you know there's something you've got to work on, and you work on it. That doesn't mean you throw away your concentration and work simply on discernment. If you realize that your concentration needs development, you work at that, and you allow it to mature. You allow it to settle in, become a good foundation. So this lack of contentment doesn't mean that you try to rush through things. It means that you simply realize there's more work to be done and you do, no, do what needs to be done, even if it means developing patience, developing endurance. So the practice finally will bear fruit. The area where the Buddha does teach contentment is in the outside circumstances of your life. If there are things that you cannot change, you learn how to accept that. But you've got to test that. What exactly can you change and what can't you change? Think about cooking. Say you've got an egg. That's all you've got. So you have to be content with the egg. But that doesn't mean that you eat the thing raw or that you eat the shell. You have to figure out which parts of the egg are useful, which ones are not, and then how you get the most advantage out of the parts that are useful. So you learn how to 
cook it in various ways. So it really does give a benefit to the body. Otherwise, if you don't know how to handle it, it actually can become poisonous. And so it's the same with your situation in life. You figure out what can be changed and use what you can, given your situation, to improve things. Otherwise, you want to learn skills. So you can walk into a situation and get the most out of it. And that's the approach you take to the breath. It's not a matter of simply sitting with whatever the breath is going to do, because as you're going to find out, what the breath is going to do is not totally out of your control. There's an element of your shaping it, your intention in how you want the body to feel in the present moment, whether it's conscious or subconscious, that's going to shape the rate at which you breathe, the depth, the speed, the length of the breath. There's an element of fabrication that goes into this that you really want to get to know. So the best way to get to know it is to learn how to fashion things in a skillful way. So contentment here doesn't mean just putting up with whatever the breath is doing, because there are ways in which the breath can really get unhealthy. You get into bad feedback loops where there's a pain in the body, so you breathe in a way that tries to avoid the pain, and that constricts the breath even more, makes the pain worse. You want to learn how to get out of that feedback loop. One way is to very deliberately breathe very deep, very long, even though in the beginning it may seem strenuous and not all that comfortable. But you find that it resets the body so that you get out of that feedback loop. There are lots of things you can learn about the breath as you play with it, watch it, play with it some more, watch it some more. In this way it's like learning how to take that egg and get the most use out of the egg. So contentment doesn't mean just putting up with whatever is there. It means figuring out what can you change to your advantage, and what things can you not change for the time being, so you learn how to accept them and work around them. But you're always testing the limits. We don't just say okay, everything is in constant stressful and not self, so we just let it be in constant stressful and not self. You actually have to push against those characteristics. You're trying to find a state of mind that is relatively constant, that has some ease, has as much ease as you can make, actually, and that you can learn how to control as much as you can, because that's going to be your path. Now, ultimately, you will run up to the fact that even the greatest states of concentration have their limitations. And it's on that frontier where the limitations are. That's where you're going to gain discernment. But if you don't know where the frontier is and just simply accept things or give up, I know some people say, well, the, the path is something that's impermanent, concentration is impermanent, even awakening is impermanent, so you just kind of give up. That doesn't accomplish anything. That attitude actually short circuits the path. So as we meditate, we're exploring to see where the line between what we can control and what we can't control lies, and try to make the most of what we can. That's the attitude that the Buddha wants us to develop towards contentment. In other words, it's not just sitting with whatever is there. It's learning how to make the best use of what you've got. both in terms of your outside surroundings and in terms of the mind. And that way the principle of contentment and not contentment becomes a single principle. So keep trying to explore that frontier. Because that's where these two principles do become one. And they really do work toward a happiness that is worthy of contentment.